And today is Wednesday, July 15th, 2020, and we are meeting electronically. We have, I forgot to count, I think 10, 10 board members present representing nine votes. Welcome everybody. The first item is the agenda review. I don't believe there are any changes to the agenda. So could I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Thank you, Al. I'll second. Nina, thank you. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, nine zero. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Dr. Derrick, I believe you have some people that you'd like to introduce? Yes. Uh, we have three new administrators who started July 1st. Most of the board has met them earlier, but they are now at their first board meeting, and I would like to introduce them and also welcome them to Maple Run and to their first board meeting. So we have, and I'm sorry, I've got three pages here, so I, I, I don't always see the people. But one of them is Stephanie Ripley. Stephanie is Stephanie, she's on my page one. Stephanie is our new ECP director, taking Melanie's place. Uh, so welcome, Stephanie. Up in the my right hand corner, all the way from Venezuela, because he can't still can't leave. Uh, Martin Katam, our technology director. So he's in Venezuela. He's been with us every single day, virtually, and is already learning the learning the ropes. It's good to have you, Martin. And the third person I'd like to introduce is Brett Blanchard. Brett has uh, is taking over as his high school principal, UFA principal. Uh, much to the chagrin of Bill Kimball, because I know he loved it, but we need him back down at uh, Central Office. Now. So welcome, Brett, too. It's nice having all of you with us. Yes, welcome all of you. We're happy to have Bill back, too. I told him now he has to do his real job. <laughs> um, okay. We're gonna move on then to the visitor section. So this is our public comment area, and this is where members of the public get a chance to address the board. Um, Jason, do you wanna go through them, I guess, if you just call out a name? Sure. I'd like to give everybody about two minutes. So Kate, please take yep. place, because we have a lot of people. Sure, Kate LaRose. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kate LaRose and I am a resident of St. Albans City. I am here tonight because I care deeply about creating an educational system reflective of Maple Run's mission, one in which all students can learn, achieve, and succeed. My experience includes six years working at the Vermont Agency of Education on the Safe and Healthy Schools team, where I learned the critical importance of student safety and well-being on academic performance, and the truth that schools have precious few resources to invest in this programming. I've also served as both a federal peer reviewer and panel manager for programs that have the express purpose of helping students learn in safe environments, including funding through DOE's Office of Safe and Drug-Free Schools and the DOJ's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. These experiences reiterated the importance of local, edu local education agencies selecting interventions that have an evidence base of actually solving the problems they wish to address. And perhaps most importantly, I'm here today as a community member with a disability myself and a mother to two sons, one who is white and has a neuropsychiatric disorder and attends St. Albans City School, and one who is black and come home, comes home shaken every time a city police officer stops him on the street. 
State and national data clearly spell out that SRO programming causes harm and that this harm is disproportionately done to students who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, students with disabilities, and LGBTQIA students. Yesterday, school board members received a letter from the Vermont Disability Law Project that provides links to additional reports with state and county level data to this regard. Last week, Dr. Dirth shared in a letter stating that data available for the SRO program at Maple Run is anecdotal at best. However, the statewide and national data available detailing the harm caused is extensively documented, objective, and too exhaustive to list in the time permitted via public comment. Maple Run students cannot learn, achieve, or succeed when they do not feel safe. I stand with Vermont's Human Rights Commission, Racial Justice Alliance, ACLU, Legal Aid, NAACP chapters, and Neighbors for Safer St. Albans in asking that the board remove police personnel from our schools and invest these dollars in evidence-based programming that leads to the outcomes we all want, an educational system in which all students can feel safe and learn. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, I just wanted to say that, um, Kate, thank you for introducing yourself and saying what town you're from. If everybody could do that, that would be great. Who's next, Jason? Mary Johnson. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. I don't have the resume that Kate LaRose does, but I um, stand in solidarity with what she mentioned. Um, I'm a teacher and um, I've worked in several public school systems, and I know that the social emotional health and well being of students is key and crucial to their learning. I also know that there are a lot of needs with regards to social emotional health. I stand for um, instead of having SROs in school, using that money to have, have more mental health workers, social workers, so that we can meet those social emotional needs. I know that students. If you, if you can't reach them, you can't teach them. And if they are struggling with whatever stressors they have in their lives, and from whatever um, that could be due to the color of their skin or for a lot of other reasons, but those needs are important. And if we don't meet those, then we're not gonna teach them. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Jason? And correct me if I get your first name wrong, Mr. Erickson. Is it Ryer Erickson? Yep, yep, Ryan Erickson, thank you. Thank Good you, job. I wanted to make sure I got it right. I've been working on that one since I saw your name go in there. <laughs> it's a tough one, good job. Uh, my name is Ryan Erickson, I live in St. Albans City. I have two children who will be attending St. Albans City School this year. Um, in Maple Run's solidarity statement, uh, you stated the Maple Run Unified School District is where inquiring minds, compassionate hearts, creative expression, healthy lives, and service to the community develop so all can learn, achieve, and succeed. Unfortunately, unfortunately for many children, including my own, that isn't attainable with an SRO on campus. In terms of solidarity, it's very hard to stand in solidarity with the community while supporting a system that disadvantages and oppresses them. Evidence for the benefits of, of SROs is largely anecdotal. However, evidence is plentiful that shows long-term damaging effects. SRO programs in schools contribute to the school to prison pipeline by increasing school-based arrests, most of which are for nonviolent off offenses such as disruptive behavior. These arrests are actually 2.2 times higher among Black, Indigenous, and children of color. In response to a letter asking for more information regarding SRO, Superintendent Dirth responded to critique of the program with the following. More than ever, a positive bridge between law enforcement and youth needs to continue to be built, and if we don't do it, who will? I posit the police should. Instead of risking the innocence of our children by bringing a police from a department with a history of violence, we should be investing in counselors, anti-bias, anti-racism training, and resources for teachers. In the aforementioned letter, Dr. Dirth acknowledges that there is, quote, implicit and even explicit bias occurring in our schools. Knowing that, how could we allow anyone, how could anyone allow a program that is proven to exacerbate bias in our schools? I stand with Vermont Legal Aid, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, the Human Rights Commission, the ACLU of Vermont, the NAACP, the Advancement Project, Neighbors for a Safer St. Albans, and various other local and national organizations in calling for an end to SROs in our schools. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Steve Messier. 
Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's good to see some former colleagues here. My name is Steve Messier. I'm a St. Albans town resident, former St. Albans city resident. I'm a local educator and former school board member at St. Albans City School and for the Franklin Central Supervisory Union. Um, I actually didn't realize that one of the topics or agenda items for tonight's meeting was going to involve discussion on the SRO positions uh, within the Maple Run uh, Supervisory Union until uh, just yesterday, actually, and, and I saw Mrs. LaRose's uh, posts on various social media outlets and, and um, felt compelled to join tonight's evening and, and speak to this uh, because it's something I'm passionate about. Um, as a local educator myself, I have a great deal of experience over the last uh, nearly 18 years working with at-risk youth uh, and working closely with law enforcement agencies and school resource officers. Uh, I believe that school resource officers are truly an invaluable asset to our community and any plan to remove them from our campuses is not only short-sighted but incredibly counterproductive to creating a welcoming cooperative and safe community as a local educator and former school board member i've had seen firsthand the positive impact that they can have on our schools and our children as dr dearth mentioned in his letter and mr erickson just referenced i would say that now more than ever we need our young people to see law enforcement as positive, helpful, supportive, and caring individuals who will work diligently to meet their needs, to validate their feelings, and work with them to resolve conflicts in healthy and socially acceptable ways. SROs are often the only bridge between disaffected or at-risk youth and the social supports that they are in need of. Time and again, I have seen the relationships that SROs foster with students be the difference in preventing tragedy and saving lives through early identification and intervention in matters of both targeted acts of violence in a school community, as well as student suicide. Our community is, is incredibly lucky to have such a close partnership between the St. Albans Police Department and our schools. So I hope that any discussion centered on school resource officers in the Maple Run Unified School District includes growing this program and not eliminating it entirely. Uh, I think Thank you for your time and I appreciate Officer Tally and any of the other uh, school resource officers who are here with us tonight. So thank you and I appreciate the work that you're doing. Thank you, Steve. I just want to say I appreciate everybody sticking to the time limit. Everybody's doing great. So thank you. Jennifer Williamson. Hi, I am Dr. Jennifer Williamson. I am a uh, primary care physician in Vermont, and I am a resident of uh, the town, the St. Albans town, and my son goes to State Tech. He is a child who has some neurodivergent tendencies, and I am concerned with the SROs being in the schools and their likelihood to cause uh, social emotional concerns for a child who already is struggling with social interactions. And I don't want to him be, to become acclimated to somebody of an oppressive source being in his school all the time. I also just want to say that Kate LaRose, Mary Johnson, and Ryder Erickson did an excellent job. And I just want to say ditto to all of them. So I won't reiterate everything they said, but um, I'm in total agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Kaki Hutchinson. Uh, hi, can you see and hear me? We can, Kaki, yeah. yes. Okay, excellent. Um, hi, I'm Kaki Hutchinson. I live in St. Albans City. I worked uh, many wonderful years at PFA St. Albans as first a school counselor and then director of counseling services. I retired six years ago, um, but have had many, many fond relationships in years at BFA. Uh, it was a wonderful school. Uh, when I was at BFA, I served on the safety committee and um, was there when SROs were introduced to BFA. I had wonderful relationships with the folks that came from the city police department. And I also believe that there is no room for police officers in our schools. I work with high-risk students all the time. I directed our counselors and supervised them. Um, uh, we had five counselors, and uh, the resources uh, that are used 
or police officers could be much better used uh, for skilled educators, counselors who have um, a background in um, dealing with uh, challenges that students have. Uh, myself and uh, another administrator started the advisory program at BFA uh, when some high-risk behaviors were happening in the country uh, with our belief that every student needs to be known very well uh, by people in the school. And that's actually the best violence prevention um, program that exists. I think uh, it's not, no detriment to the, to the people that came into the school, but they're not um, trained educators. They're not trained in dealing with high-risk students. And, um, and I, I, I don't believe that, and I never did believe that they, they should be there. I just want to mention that my interest is that the board would create a process here. We have some really um, interested people that want to get together and maybe talk about these issues. Let's have a process. Let's all get in on the same page because we all want our students to feel safe and learn at their maximum in our schools. So I hope that you'll engage with the community. There are a lot of really smart, really caring people here and that we would like to be a part of these, looking at these decisions. And um, so I hope my point is that you would create a process that we can all have a significant impact on how the resources of our school district will be used. Thank you, Kaki. Kate Bailey. Hi there. My name is Kate Bailey. My family lives in St. Albans town. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thanks. And um, I'm a healthcare advocate at Vermont Legal Aid. So I'm here tonight to share Vermont Legal Aid's disability law project letter that was sent to every school board in the state and, and should have been sent to, to you folks here and superintendent here tonight. So I wanna just encourage you again to review the letter and the data and um, I wanna share a few key points. We know based on national and state research that students of color and students with disabilities are disproportionately negatively impacted by the presence of police and school resource officers in school and by exclusionary discipline practices like suspension and expulsion. We know that when schools adopt and implement with fidelity positive behavioral intervention services, PBIS, school-wide school culture changes meaning there is even less need for police or exclusionary policies, and it improves academic performance and social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes in students. We know that when students are excluded from school and or are arrested for often age-appropriate behavior, their outcomes are worse and there are lifelong consequences. We know that police presence, surveillance equipment, and metal detectors does not reduce crime in schools. And there's no empirical evidence that school resource officers have any prevention for school shootings. We do know that school shootings are relatively rare. More children of school age are killed outside of schools than within schools. And finally, we urge Maple Run School Board to remove SROs from their schools eliminate use of suspension and expulsion, explore restorative justice practice, practices, invest resources in school counselors. Thank you, Kathy Hutchinson, I echo all of her points. Guidance counselors, teachers, and other professionals that provide support to students. That is not an SRO. These counselors, teachers, and other professionals, when they meet the students when they return this fall will have an even greater mental health and behavioral health needs after the virus. And so the time is now to take this issue seriously and um, include this community input. So I thank you for uh, calling attention to this tonight. Thank you, Kate. Mary Ann Hunkin. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can, we can. hear you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so my name is Mary Ann Hunkin. I'm a, a resident here in St. Albans City. Um, I'm here as a community member and 
bipartisan and anti-racist, anti-bias education, a former high school teacher at Enosburg Falls High School, um, and also someone who formerly worked with court-involved youth and an aunt to several beloved young people who attend several schools in the Maple Run School District. In your solidarity statement written on June 5th, you stated that you hear and see students and families who are people of color expressed a commitment to real action to end systemic racism and challenge inequity through anti-bias education in your district. Dr. Durth, in your response to the letter sent by Neighbors for Safer St. Albans, you shared anecdotal evidence that families and students have only shared positive interactions with the police in your schools. Let me say that I have heard from students who are in your school district who feel unsafe with police in their schools. If you are not hearing about this, I wonder why. And as a classroom teacher, my first question would be to figure out what about my classroom environment and my position as, a, and as an authority figure is making it unsafe for people to express that dissatisfaction. Also, I would like for people to move away from the idea that police are, um, you know, that violent police are just bad apples um, that um, Steve Messier alluded to. Policing as an institution upholds imbalanced power structures and systems of oppression. The problem with police should not be seen as situational or temporary. It's embedded within the fabric of policing. And I call on you to be critical about the police as an institution and not as individuals who are deserved of, of humanity and kindness, but as an institution. Um, and I would I call on you to be critical about their position in, in schools. Um, a commitment to anti-bias, anti-racist education does not only pertain to instruction, and it's not enough to only say that and commit to that with words. It calls on schools to create environments where all students and families feel safe, heard, seen, and empowered. And from where I'm sitting, it seems like there's work to be done to make schools in Maple Run more inclusive and safe for students. And it's time for Maple Run to take action. And the first step you can do to take that action is to remove SROs from schools. And I would also just like to echo I hear what Kate, Ryer, Jen, Khaki, and Kate, both Kates have said, and just want to really amplify that I'm with them and all the things that they shared. Thank you so much for the time to make. Thank you, Marianne. Marisa Miles. Hi, I'll, um, I'm a city uh, resident, um, city of St. Albans, and I just want to echo to what Kate, Mary, Ryer, Jennifer, Kate, and Mary Ann all said. I also um, recently am an educator and I just recently came from a school where students are really um, speaking out. And I think it's important to point out that students of color, um, black, indigenous, people of color in general, um, are not, they don't always feel safe in schools anyways. Um, and so putting in having SROs there is just another kind of um, image that is like, causes fear and I think it's really important to keep that in mind and so I just wanted to echo all of that. Um, in terms of thinking about that some people do have good experiences, um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that um, choosing those like to say oh there are some good experiences over the possible negative experiences especially for people who are already oppressed or marginalized um, is an issue and it's potentially choosing white comfort over um, what others are calling for. So something to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. I believe that that's the last person on the list. Jason, is that's there- That's correct, any, Jeff. Is there any other members of the public who would like to address the board that we missed? Jeff, I think you have Molly. Molly? Yeah, hey, Jason, it's Dr. Molly Keith. How are you doing? Hi, Molly. I can't see you, but I'm, I'm just going to speak off the, the cuff. And I understand and I encompass and I embrace the thoughts of, of getting rid of SRO. But I wonder about the timing. We're in COVID right now. There's enough crisis. We don't need to have more dimension. I can tell you personally, um, I'm a resident of St. Albans Town. Um, I've been a volunteer there uh, for five years. I have seen the SROs if you want uh, to mitigate, they have been invaluable. I have seen at least 10 different times children of color. I am gay. 
they've taken care of my kids in the most loving and compassionate way possible. The skin color, the orientation for the SATEC SROs have been outstanding. It helps me know that my kids are taken care of. And I, I understand the pipeline to prison. I understand the whole thing. But I think we need to take an approach where it's um, where we appreciate, not just put down and condemn. I think there are some excellent SROs at our school, and all I can speak is for my point. But I also, uh, you know, I want to say, like right now, I feel like everything's on fire, and we're talking about the plumbing. And what I mean by that is we've got this COVID situation going on, and then you take this away, and you guys aren't understanding. Some kids are terrified. My kids embrace the police. The fact that they're there, they feel safer. They feel if they get out of control, the police are going to help them. The police are very positive. So you take them away. For the kids who are scared of the place there are kids, when you take them away, they're going to be just as scared. Um, so, I, I, you know, I like to say, you know, my, I have two children that are, have severe disabilities, and I just I think we need to, to really encompass that. And so, I, like I said, it took a year and a half. I'll be off one second. It took a year and a half to get one mental counselor for my kid. So saying we're going to get all these people coming in support is a wonderful idea, but there aren't people who want these jobs. So... I thank you for your time and uh, I appreciate all and I understand both sides. So I hope you all have a good day. Thank you. Okay, I don't see anybody else on the chat list. Brenda, do you see anybody, Jason? Um, we just had somebody join. I don't know if she wants to speak or not and I lost her name, so. Yeah, Kate Bailey. And she already spoke. Yep, so. she was coming back in. Yeah. Okay. Seeing no other people, then we are going to move on to item five, which is the um, administrative administration's presentation. Dr. Jurth. Good evening, everybody. Uh, as the board knows, for, for a while, we were going to put this uh, on our agenda just to give the board some information relative to, uh, to our SROs. It becomes even more timely now with uh, all the thoughts and concerns that have been uh, brought up over the last few weeks, and certainly in the times we're in. So this is this will be just an overview of our program, uh, and then board members, obviously, if you have questions, we will attempt to to answer them. First off, I want to introduce our three SROs that were with us this last year. Uh, who I believe are all on. Paul Talley, who was our city SRO. Catherine Hansen, who was at SATEC. And Christine Cook, who was at BFA. So thank you for the three of you uh, for being on tonight and to, to act as a resource if there are certain questions. So, as you can hear from that, we have three SROs at, at the three schools. In addition, our smaller school, uh, Fairfield, has access to our three SROs as needed, so that we do have um, people who come out to that school also. But they, they are mainly in the three larger schools. They're contracted with the state, uh, with the city police. The board has seen the, uh, the MOUs, the, which gives the roles and responsibilities of the SROs. Each, right now, the cost is 82,000 per SRO for the three. They're funded slightly differently. Two of them are funded through local funds, BFA and SATEC. And our newest SRO, which is the city, and it was last year was the first year, or is, um, is done through Medicaid funds. And those Medicaid funds are grant funds that have to be used specifically for uh, prevention for students, uh, which the escrow fits in quite nicely. It's true that when I wrote a letter, I said most of the data we have is anecdotal, and that, and that is correct, mainly because the majority of time our SROs are up there. 
are, they are working with students, they're relating to students, they're involved with students, they're working to de-escalate issues, they're working with parents. And so that is anecdotal information. However, we do have, as I said in my letter, we do have data that's, that is housed at the police department. And I wanted to give you a little bit of that to, to give you a taste of uh, what has occurred over the last two years with our SROs in our building. And thanks to Paul Talley for, for helping with this. So at BFA, the incidents, which I would call the, the high level incidents, which are the, the rarities, but, but do happen. Uh, over the last two years, there were 14 cases. And those, those cases involve simple assaults, resisting arrests, disorderly conducts, unlawful mischief, criminal threatening, possession of weapons, uh, or possession of drugs over that time period. In SATAC over the last three years, two years, I'm sorry, with three cases, uh, many of them being drug sales on school grounds and one unlawful, unlawful mischief. In city, we've only got one year of data because they've only been here one year and there were four cases and they range from unlawful mischief, in one case a felony, to unlawful trespassing and one disorderly conduct. Now, what we don't have, which I can, I can obtain, because this was mentioned tonight, is I can't tell you the race of the people or the disabilities. And that information, while we have, I mean, I don't have it in front of me right now. And it is something I think it's worthwhile to, to look at. Um, when we hire our SROs, we hire them in a collaborative manner with the St. Albans Police Department. We work very, very closely with them. We look very carefully for who we get. We do not, we have to have people who have more skills than just being a law enforcement officer. We have to make sure they're trained in areas such as the um, de-escalation, implicit bias, uh, and then there's a whole training that's done by this, the SRO Association. And we, we are very careful with the people we select because our most important aspect is the fact we need people who can work with students. And that's not always what happens. So we wanna make sure that that's, uh, we work with Gatewell, with Chief Taylor we've been working with and in the future, we hope to be working with Mo on this to make sure that happens. And there are uh, school administrators involved in that, as well as the, the chief, to make sure we have the appropriate people. And then those people are monitored as they go along. They're evaluated by the, the city police because they are city police employees contracted by us. However, we give there's a lot of good input and a lot of good communication that occurs throughout. And I have to personally say, I, I feel safer and, and just very pleased that that communication happens because that doesn't always happen. There's always some, some tension or often some tension between the uh, police departments and the schools and other places. And that does not happen here. The communication is good. And we, f we feel we have, we get good people. We have had certain incidents at times, general incidences where we've had to have the discussion um, and some additional training and things like that. That's more the exception than, than the rule with our, with our SROs. You have a document that was in my letter, which, which I also sent you from the SRO Association and we follow that pretty carefully around rules and responsibilities with the, uh, with the school resource officers. They do not do discipline, and that is a priority. 
They're not uh, disciplinarians. That is through our administrators. And we keep it that way. There has to be that, that difference between what SROs do and what, what schools do. But they also work with students. They, they work with parents who, for instance, have custody issues and need to speak to them about this. They are a liaison sometimes between the home uh, with parents over legal issues and the schools. They, are, they relate to the kids positively. Um, our experience has been generally that they, they work well with the kids and uh, the kids look forward to having them. They also teach some classes in areas around drugs, um, around safety issues. And finally, they really do work on, on issues around safety. They're on all of our safety committee meetings. They help us uh, as the experts show where we're, we may be lacking in safety. I can remember just the last few years, they've helped us with BFA on what we need to do to tighten up the, the BFA up relative to doors, locks, windows, uh, the, the, how we get people in and out of the of a school. So they've been very, very helpful in that way to, uh, to work with us as a district to make sure that we, uh, we can do what we need to do and we're safe about it. I would say that with the with MOU you've got, and I think I may have mentioned this, I, I've, I've felt for a year that we should look at, and I've talked to Gary Taylor, and we'll, we'll also be talking to the SROs. We do need to look at the MOU. I think we can do a better job being more specific in the job responsibilities around um, the things that I earlier mentioned around training and making sure they have certain specific training uh, to make that happen. The training, in many cases, the offices in the police department don't have, but if you're an SRO, you need to, you need to have. As far as we, as far as the benefits, we've, we've talked about that uh, already. I just spoke about it. I do have a document that I'd like to put up, but before that, that I kind of collected from our staff just to hear from them relative to how they felt things were working within the schools. But before that, I've, had, I've got a couple of people who would like to speak on it. So I, I think there's three of them, three mainly principals. So I want to give them the opportunity to, to speak about anything I might have missed on. And I, I don't see her right now, but I'm so she's somewhere. Uh, Angela Stebbins, would you like to speak? Kevin, I, I'd be happy to speak. I appreciate it. So mentioning, um, you know, the schools are very committed to positive interventions through PBIS, conscious discipline. We are all working um, on restorative practices. We believe in all of that, and it's very important in our schools. And I think that um, you, you need, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. First, to understand, I've been a teacher and an administrator in the state of Vermont for almost 30 years, 20 of those years um, as an administrator. And as, as a principal, I have many job responsibilities, but the most important job responsibility I have is keeping my staff and students safe within my school building. If you look at SACS and SATEC, we are among the top largest pre-K-8 schools in the state of Vermont. BFA is also quite large, but not as large as, as some of the other high schools. So we have, we have a lot of, uh, of staff and students, I would say well over a thousand every day, that is my responsibility to make sure that they're safe. I'm gonna give you a date, August 24th, 2006. And that date I will never forget. I had a, a veteran, very well-respected teacher come into my office crying, Linda Lambessi, and she said, Angela, 
my daughter broke, broke up with her boyfriend. I'm really worried. I want to go home and change my locks. She's over working in Essex Elementary. And I said, Linda, don't worry about it. If you need to do that, please go take care of your, your locks in your house. If that's going to make you feel better, you'll catch up with the other teachers on what you missed. So she left. And through my law enforcement connections, I received information that there was a, a school shooting at S Essex Elementary School. And the perpetrator had not been apprehended and they were reportedly heading up Route 128, which is just toward us. So I, I got with my assistant principal and I s said, I'm not liking this. This can't be related. It can't be. But I'm, I'm not feeling real comfortable. We got on the intercom. It was before the end of the workday. And we told everybody, pack your stuff, head out. It's an emergency. School's going to be locked down. Go home. I shortly thereafter found out that Linda Lambesi had been gunned down and killed in her home. And that, that was the date of the Essex school shooting, which uh, two teachers lost their lives and other injuries. And I will never forget that day. And I spent that evening with a bunch of other people calling my staff to let them know one of their teachers was killed. So I keep a bulletproof vest in my office. And that I would take a bullet for any one of my students, but having the SRO in the building, keeping track of, we know that many of the school shootings come from domestic violence issues. And if you can give me data that our domestic violence is gone, then let's talk about it. But I don't see that as happening because that's where many of our issues are, are occurring. We know through COVID, the schools have been closed in the country. We haven't had the big headlines of school shootings, thank God. And I hope we never have another one. But having the SRO in the building to keep track of social media, keep track of what's going on in the community, going through and watching if there's things bubbling up, someone to call if you know there's someone that's going to be coming toward the building and preventing them from getting in. There is no dollar amount that I can put on that. And, and no one's going to learn if people, if someone comes in our school and starts shooting. So to me, that is paramount. And that is the most important thing we need to think about. I also care very much about my school board. And they really need to do some legal research into the doctrine of deliberate indifference and that happened in sandy hook i don't want to see my school board getting sued if an incident were to happen because if you take sros out of some of these large pre-k-8 schools in our high school and something horrific happens that they're going to come after you and i don't want that to happen for the sake of anyone getting hurt and i don't want anyone in that position and i would just implore i want to say publicly that I 100% support having our SROs in our schools. And I, I don't want to see any kind of an issue. There's a huge list of positive things that our SROs do. And, and, it, and it relates to mental health and supporting kids, preventing suicide. There is data. SROs help prevent suicides in kids. And so look at that list. And if anyone wants, I know there's a couple positive things about SATEC, but if anyone was at the assembly when Sheriff Longevin was leaving us in December of 2018 and saw the heartfelt, the tears from parents and kids that he was leaving us, he made a huge and powerful impression that was positive, not only on our students, but our parents. And that's a huge connection that I think we're missing that is very important. So school safety is number one, and I 100% support us keeping our SROs, and I really implore the school board uh, to please consider that. Thank you, Angela. Uh, Joan Cavallo is the principal of our city school, who has a brief thing she'd like to say. So city was pretty late to the game as far as getting an SRO. We've had one for a little over a year. Um, for us, I wanted to make sure that our kids always knew that we could take care of them. Um, this was not about discipline at all. And we were really solid with our conscious discipline and our restorative practices. We felt really good about that. What we weren't sure we felt good about was that we could keep our kids safe from the outside world. That was probably the thing that pushed us the most. Um, and that was when we did decide to bring in an SRO. And what we were looking for was someone 
a lot like what Zaytek is talking about, someone that's going to help us keep the outside world away from our kids. Um, in conscious discipline, we have a thing that we, we say to our children, and I say it to my staff and to the children, my job is to keep you safe. And a lot of what you heard with Angela's passion around what the, the level of responsibility when a thousand people are in your building and your job is to keep all of them safe. And that was the only reason why they, this um, city did it uh, a little over a year ago. And we're not sorry because what has happened in that year that we knew about things immediately and we were able to pull kids into the building and do what we needed to do without anybody being worried or afraid that level of communication and knowing just what's going on in the community around us was what we were looking for. And that was what we got from the program. Along, along I, I think the last person who asked to speak was, uh, now I can call him the assistant principal, uh, the assistant superintendent again, uh, Bill. Thanks, Kevin. I was a little worried there. You were about to downgrade me. I know it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say downgrade because we have plenty of great assistant principals. That's, <laughs> that's a slip on me, but uh, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, as, as many of you know, I was the interim principal at BFA for this past year. It was my first experience of working in a Vermont setting that we'll call a high school in the middle of a city and yes we know that vermont cities are not the same as other urban places in the nation uh and having worked in in many rural areas in vermont for over 25 years of my career here in vermont um i didn't know the importance of an sro and this was my first experience of working with an sro uh, and i have to say it was extremely positive and one of the things that really helped um, was the interface with uh, Christine uh, Corporal Cook and uh, the St. Albans Police for matters that were happening right outside the right outside the campus of BFA that were happening within the city that would cause issues for our students and sometimes it would get us into a serious place of having to go into a lockdown um, or at least to secure the building. And other times it was just making sure that kids were safe before and after school. Um, the collaboration that happened was tremendous. Uh, there wasn't a time, at, you know, and, and the professionalism of Corporal Cook is just, I, I couldn't say any, I couldn't elevate it any higher in my praise. She just did, a, she did a great job. And also I observed her many, many times working with kids in a proactive, positive way. Um, one of the things that uh, she was assigned to and, and the previous SRO was uh, working with kids in common spaces and just saw many positive interactions with kids and role modeling. And that role modeling, um, I, I saw it with all different, all sorts of kids. Um, and I just think it was a great way for kids to get to know, you know, that there's another human being behind that badge. So um, I just think it was a very, great resource for the schools and for the students and for the community of St. Albans. Thank you, Bill. Uh, I forgot something. I apologize when we were talking the data. So I, I spoke to you about the, the uh, what was it, 17, 21 cases over two years in those three. What I forgot to mention to you was we also had 51 cases which we didn't have to, which the, the, the SROs did not have to go to a, a point of, of uh, arresting or anything like that. And we had 51 cases we went directly, uh, we were referred to restorative justice. So I, I, I feel that's strong. We have a restorative justice program. It's, it's, it's beginning, it's not totally there in every single building yet. Every single building is working to build that program because we think it works. And the more that students can talk to students or students to teachers or students to, to SROs and, and have that, that discussion given a very strict protocol around how to do that, we have found it's been very successful. 
and we, we want to continue to build that program. Um, as I said, I have a I have a list of, of things that I was going to put up for the board, but I think I might just have Brenda attach it because I've already talked to Juan, and and I know we have other things to do. I think the we certainly have got the important things out. I, I just want to mention that first off, I realized after doing the presentation that I had planned for a while, that this may come across and look at those people who spoke earlier passionately as we disagree with you and there is no place to improve and I certainly don't mean that in any way. I think there's always places we can prove. I think we, we, this discussion is important and I think it, we can look at this. Having said that, I, I have to admit, our experience has been positive. We feel the experience is positive and, and we are supportive of the program. As I said earlier, I think we do need to look at training a bit more and how that's done and, and be more definitive. Uh, we might have to do more with communication. And I don't want anybody to think that it's us against them. I appreciate what we've heard and I want to continue hearing these things. And I hope those who felt passionately the other way will listen to us and that we can work together on this because that's what I, that's what I would hope. Um, I just feel the people we have and, and generally the people we've had along the way are kind, they're empathetic, they're there for the right reason and they add value. They don't replace our social workers. They don't replace our school counselors. They don't replace our home community liaisons. They certainly don't replace our administrators, but they add value. They're another layer uh, in, a, in, a, in a system, in a school system. And they're another layer that just improves it even more around security and safety. And, and we felt that they've been a, a help to us. And since the three of them are there, I can't, I can't leave without at least specifically thanking them. Uh, Kit, Kat, Paul, Thank you for what you've done. I think it's a good job and I, I hope we can continue this while continuing to look at how do we do things better. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Are there any board members that have questions for Kevin? Steve, and then Grant. First, uh... Uh, thank you to everyone who's spoken tonight. It's a discussion well worth having. Um, if I could, uh, Kevin, um, has anyone at this point considered um, surveying the community, um, students and parents of our students to get a feel for what may be going through their mind? Perhaps some people are not quite comfortable coming forward this evening who would be more comfortable speaking confidentially. Um, I'd be curious to... And I'm sorry, Steve, with my system, you came across kind of muffled and I really, I didn't hear the whole thing. I'll try again. <laughs> Maybe I'll speak up. Is that better? Yeah. I just wanted to thank people for coming out and speaking. It's a, a discussion well worth having. And I was curious whether or not anyone would consider surveying the community, particularly interested in hearing from students and parent voices. Um, just uh, something to throw out there, I guess. And there's certainly no reason we can't do that. If that's your question. Well, I mean, obviously it would seem that there are those in the community who are uh, who welcome the SRO and others who don't. And it's a question of um, what's, what's the right path to take here. Um, and uh, the more input, the better. And I would imagine an organized survey could it be of some benefit perhaps. Thanks, Steve. Um, Grant? Um, 
Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so it's, I think, been maybe implied that, um, you know, the, the funding for SROs um, could in some way be transferred over to, um, you know, other resources. Uh, and also that that funding will continue. Um, and so we're, we've sort of uh, been considering it as like a zero sum game. I'm wondering if that's a valid assumption um, or if there would be additional dollars available through state programs, federal programs, whatever, um, if we wanted to implement more um, of the, the more uh, like social work type uh, approaches, uh, you know, to complement the SROs or if it really would be, um, you know, a one or the other kind of a proposition. Thanks, Grant. Uh, Susan. So I have a whole bunch of questions that I'm just going to toss out there that I think we need to consider. Like some of my questions are in regards to, um, like I'm going to say the number of arrests made by SROs in the past five years or four years, um, the number of arrests made within the school itself versus outside the school building, um, more detail on the, like the data of what the SROs are actually doing um, in the schools, um, more detail on the um, even the information that Kevin gave us in terms of one of the things he said was, I think, um, uh, 14 cases that must have in the last two years at BFA, simple assault, resisting arrest, um, possession of weapons or drugs. So I'm wondering which of those happen within the school building versus without outside the school building. Um, so really more data and I certainly support even and even at the smaller schools three cases in two years at town school and four in the last year at city school like more details about did that include adults or was that actually students that were arrested so for me it'd be helpful to get a better understanding of those numbers just so I know what's going on in the school system um, and then also I guess I would support certainly a whole community a forum in regards to how we proceed forward with this. That's all. Thanks, Susan. Am I missing any board members? Jeff, this is Alicia. Hi. I have a question. Hi, Alicia. Um, I just, and I don't need an answer tonight, but um, I'm just wondering with um, remote learning, what is the role of the SRO been? Are they helping um, with safety check. I just am asking what that role has been for SROs and what the um, obligation of MRUSD is if we continue on remote learning. And I know we're going to talk COVID and planning later, but I would like to just have some more information on that if possible. Yeah, that's a good question. Anybody else before we move on? Any other board members? Yeah. I just want to support the things that have been said and the questions that have been asked. And, um, you know, I've also worked in the school for many years and have, um, I can appreciate both sides uh, to this conversation. I have witnessed and experienced lots of positive um, interactions with SROs in the past. And uh, when other um, law enforcement come into the school, but I also appreciate the comments that have been made and have experienced students who have gotten, you know, physically or visibly uncomfortable with with uh, law enforcement in the building. So I I know that it does exist. So just wanted to say, I think a continued conversation will be invaluable. Thank you, Joanna. Okay, I think we're going to move on to I'd the- I'd like to add one last thing because I see some of the questions and I heard from the board. I will, I will have the three page document that had the, inter, in, the information uh, 
that I ask for from staff and whatever around roles and responsibilities and what they do specifically. And I'll also make sure uh, our neighbors receive that too. So that will help a little bit on, you not you haven't seen that yet because I told, time. I'm but sorry, we'll Kevin, I posted that in the chat. Can everybody see it? So you can, they can click on the link? Yes, and, and download it, I believe. Yeah, I do see it. It was at 6.52 p.m. Thanks, Brenda. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, everybody. Let's move on to the consent agenda. We have the approval of the minutes of June 17th and the July 1st special meeting, new staff lists and media. Um, if anybody wants to remove any of these items from the consent agenda for discussion, um, let me know if I don't hear any objections, the consent agenda will be adopted. Hearing none, the consent agenda is adopted. Now we'll move on to old business 7A COVID-19 update. I'm sorry, you get to hear from me again. <laughs> so. Someday it will stop. <laughs> So anybody who's been unfortunate enough to turn the television on over the last few weeks knows that there's an awful lot of drama out there, as there should be, around opening schools and a lot of differences of opinions. We're working with our state, as we have all along, we've been working with our state uh, health people and our state a agency of education who have put out health guidance and that's been out for a while although that health guidance for those people who look at that health guidance and turn on the link on a daily basis see that it changes pretty much on a daily basis and we have to be ready for those changes but there are health guidance out there relative to if we open schools what we need to make sure we do and they're they're fairly, fairly specific, but not so. In other words, they'll say, you should make sure students are six feet away from each other. But by the way, that's a recommendation and you have to do your best. And that makes it very tough for the people who are implementing the plans because we don't know, okay, you're saying best practice is six feet away from each other with a mask. However, we understand if you can't do that. So we're trying to get better guidance to make better decisions. In addition, our, at this point, we still haven't received good guidance about how they want schools opened. And we've heard several things all the way from schools should open fully in the end of August to you, you might want to look at some sort of hybrid system of uh, remote and, and people in. And we don't have guidance. And I will tell you that the people who have to are in charge of, of doing this and implementing this and make sure it's done in their districts, which is the superintendents, have gotten together. We get together two to three times a week as Champlain Valley superintendents, the 16 of us. And the frustration is rising because we understand fully that we need information pretty fast to be able to make decisions if we're going to open school on I don't believe it's somewhere August 26th or something like that. And we have been pushing the AOE to give us that guidance. I believe there is some push and pull between the health department and the AOE and we can't control that. But the superintendents have gotten to the point, Champlain superintendents have cut to the point that they've kind of said Tuesday, if you don't give us this decision 
and uh, give us true specific guidance, then we're going to take the health guidance as is, and we're going to make our own decisions as a group because we have to know. So while we're closer, we don't have from a state level all the answers yet. I'm thinking we're close. I think that putting that pressure on the state will help us through that. Now, having said all that, we're not sitting silent. Um, we have several committees all working. And if you can imagine what this may look like, they're all looking at different aspects of opening and they're all looking at what it would be under which option. Well, they can't just say, okay, we're gonna do this. So how are we gonna implement that? They've got about three options they're looking at. One of them being everybody fully in school. One of them being some sort of uh, a remote system, kind of like what we're doing now. And one of them being what, what the term bandied about is um, a hybrid system. I'm personally thinking, and please don't quote me on this because it might change tomorrow. I'm personally thinking the, the direction that the state, if they, if they get to us, and certainly the superintendents are looking at, is a hybrid where certain kids are in, where only 50% of the kids in at one time. What that does, it allows us to follow the six foot rule. It allows us to have room uh, to be safe. And if they're gonna stick with the six feet with masks, one thing that is irrefutable, unrefutable, is masks. Everyone must wear masks. So we do know that. If we do a hybrid system, there's a couple ways it would go. The hybrid system might look like half of our students come in on Monday and Tuesday, half of our students come in Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, and Wednesday is used as a deep cleaning day in the schools and a day where people, students who need additional work interventions could have time but they're all different variations on it. So while we're getting at it, those opinions and finally getting where we should go and administrators, please help me with this. We have, I believe five committees who are working. Sean, you're chairing. I'm doing maintenance of operations. And can you explain that a little? It's not just you, it's Sean and Who's with you, Chair? Uh, I'm the only chair on that committee. You are, okay. Can you explain what the maintenance operations committee is doing? Yeah, basically we're trying to figure out the best way to sanitize and disinfect our spaces. And then also we're trying to think about things like if you're on the bus, what has to be done in between loads of children to make sure that the bus is clean and disinfected. Um, we have been looking at things like air handling within the buildings, filtration systems, water systems in the buildings, trying to figure out all those pieces um, that are going to help kids come back to an environment that's clean and healthy. Thanks, Sean. Sean? Yes. Let me uh, give you a scenario. Uh, the school buses generally handle about 42 students. And uh, if we're going to keep uh, some distance, we're going to probably reduce that by 20. Under the guidelines, it says you're going to take each uh, child's temperature before they get on the bus and ask them two, two, three questions. That's going to be about two to three minutes per child. So if you reduce that to 20, that means it's going to take an hour or more than it normally does. So are we extending time or are we starting early? So, 
So yeah. Alex, that's a great question. That is actually going to be Angela's committee in terms of the temperature taking um, and, and those such things. But one of the things that we know is that they want to start busing at what's called stage three, which means we're probably going to have many, many children on the buses um, at first. And then Angela, why don't you go ahead and explain what your committee has come up with in terms of the health checks. Is that okay with you? You, Kevin? Yeah, could you explain what your committee is and then right. go ahead? So I'm the chair of the Safe and Healthy Environments Committee. We have membership, all of the facility managers, nurses from all of the schools. We also have Dr. Haig, our local pediatrician, and Stacy Carpenter from the Department of Health. They've been invaluable resources on our committee. And the BF, one of the BFA nurses, Val Lipka, she's uh, also our COVID-19 coordinator. So she's been uh, very helpful on our committee. So the, the goal of our group is to dec decrease or mitigate the spread of COVID-19. So what comes into play there are the, the daily health checks of both staff and students. So there's, as, as Al questioned, yes, there's a couple ways that would happen in the, in the morning, uh, could be drop-offs, that, that students get dropped off, we do it before they come in, and then the busing piece. We are exploring several different options for that, in addition to having extra staff on the bus to help with that procedure. Also having paper copies where parents can sign after uh, reviewing their child's health before they get on the bus so that they're confirmed they can write their temperature down that morning. And there's also an app that we're looking into to, to be able to use for that definitely with staff, possibly with families, but we're still exploring that. So yes, there, there will be some considerations on how we do that and the time it would take, but we're hoping with some of the things we put in place, it will help expedite it. Also part of my committee are rules around staying home when you're sick. That's both for staff and students. Hand hygiene, masks and PPE and contact tracing. So with my committee, and you'll see it a little bit uh, later on the agenda, we had to look at um, the number of students and staff. We have about 2,700 students and over about 550 staff in the district. And so we had to look at that and then we, we came up with kind of a first uh, order to get us started on that to uh, to help keep the, the spread of COVID-19 down in the schools. And, and yes, as Kevin said, uh, the daily health checks and the masks are both mandatory as far as uh, the guidelines and what we have to put forward. And Al, what we figured out was that we are going to have to, um, we are gonna have to see how the bus routes will be impacted. And we may have to consider staggered schedules. Um, if we have a hybrid model where only half the children are in on a given day, then that may take care of that issue for us. Um, there was a question over in the chat. Am I allowed to answer those questions if they come from the community? I just wanted to, I don't think I am an open meeting law, but I want people to know that we can see the questions. I just don't want to go in there and do something that's going to be wrong. I, I, Jeff, what do you think? Yeah, if you see something and you know the answer, go ahead. Okay, thank you. And that's what I might say is people, if you look, administrators, if you're looking, I'm, I'm not able to facilitate everything as we go along, but if you're seeing a question that you can answer, uh, feel free to, to, to answer that. Uh, one thing I would tell you as a board that you need to know, Angela was telling me today that was beginning to add up our costs that are, are, are directly COVID related. And she's looking at over $100,000 uh, just initially. So it is our hope that we're gonna get reimbursed for these COVID related expenses. We keep being told that there's gonna be a, a protocol to allow us to do that. And we need to code it a certain way and we need to keep keep tabs of it. The, the slight cynic in me is not sure, but hoping for the best. But whether, whether we're gonna get reimbursed or not, we need to do it. And we're, we just have to work within our budget and then hopefully we'll find certain things that don't have to be done because of this and then we could utilize that money. But 
uh, we are working to get reimbursed and all that. Angela, was I right on the cost? You're muted, Angela. Yes, it's over 115,000. I was on, I was on mic and I turned myself off. So thank you. Yeah. And, and that's coming up and I'll go over that in a little more detail, but that is correct. That's expensive. So, um, Joan, would you like to talk on your committee or Bill? Right. Bill Joan, maybe first. So we're the continuity of education committee. So Bill and Sarah and I have co-chaired that. Um, so we get to, to look at um, all this, what if um, we bring back all the kids in what's called stage two, which is really, really tight. What if we bring all the kids in what's called stage three, which is a little bit looser. And then what could a hybrid look like? And so those are some of the things we've been exploring. We've also been exploring things like Again, the busing, because the busing has multiple dimensions to it. There's a health and safety dimension to it. And there's also what they call the pod size or the number of kids in on different places. So a lot of our different committees actually overlap a great deal. That's one of the things we're starting to get into now. So we delved into the document, broke it apart, each took a section of it, and have been working with teachers from all of the Things. And um, that's what our committees have looked like just from a makeup perspective. So we've been really trying to bring in a lot of voices to get this level done. The big thing with our committee is that um, we now have basically given the guidance, but the guidance is so specific that in order to really solve it, you have to get to the school level. So starting next week, the schools are going to start is to start looking at this from their perspectives with their resources and everything that they know about their school. Like in my school, I have so many rooms and I have so many doors and I have so many bathrooms. So if I'm gonna create pods, I have to give them rooms, I have to give them separate bathrooms, I have to figure out what door they're coming in, what door they're leaving. That's the kind of work we have to do next. Thanks, John. Bill? Yep, I'm uh, co-chairing with uh, Lisa DeRocha, the, the leadership, uh, human resources, policies and budget subcommittee. Uh, we've been, and, and we added communications to it. Um, it's a, we've kind of been following the outline from the state of Vermont. Uh, you'll see the our community will see the first of our COVID communications during the summer starting tomorrow and, and Friday uh, via letter and video. Uh, we're also working on revamping our COVID webpage and website and getting more information up there for parents and students and for the community. Um, also, I've been working uh, uh, with Mike Campbell, who's been the negotiator for the association. We've been working together on some of the human resource issues and what will be our procedures uh, for staff members for when they have health related issues uh, related, related and not related to COVID. Uh, we have to look at kind of both of those and what our procedures will be to ensure safety for staff and for students. Um, Right now, we're kind of holding on the policy and procedure pieces because we want to get some of the details figured out that not only the committee that we're, that I'm helping to lead, but all the four other committees so that we can wrap around with, with uh, procedures. We don't think there's going to be any policy implications for the board. Um, we haven't seen anything come out as model out of VSBA, but we're still taking a look at that. And then the last one, which is the big one, which is budget implications is, uh, Kevin just talked about the supply pieces. We're also looking at the human resource costs. Um, as I think many of us have heard, there we, we have to have bus monitors on the buses and uh, we're gonna need deeper cleaning within the building. So we're still trying to model that one up for the board and for everyone else for those costs. I don't know if Martha's on here as well. You've been in those meetings. Kevin, you were part of that committee as well. I don't know if I missed something if I went went over stuff too fast. No, I think you, you did pretty well. Martha, do you have anything to add? He says no. No. Okay. He pretty much covered it. And I, kudos to everybody, but, but Stacy and Lisa and that committee with communication have been extremely helpful as far as how we're going to get information out to the public, doing it regularly. Uh, Bill and everybody else working on the surveys that are going out. They've got me stuck with doing a video every week. 
Uh, and that's not my forte, but I'm doing a video every week so we can, I can give out the information to, uh, and we can keep it regular and consistent as we know things. So, have, did I miss anybody? You missed no. Oh, Alexis, thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, so, I am facilitating along with Andrea Rasick the Social and Emotional Health Committee. And uh, that is really exactly what the title says it is. So we're really focusing on how to support everyone, not just students, but uh, students, families, and uh, staff on returning to school in the most therapeutic way possible. Um, and that looks like from looking at maybe PD opportunities for staff around compassion fatigue or how to respond to students who may be struggling with following the new uh, safety guidelines, doing outreach um, in partnership with families and making sure that their voices are being heard as well in terms of um, what they need on, on their end in terms of supporting kids with returning to schools and supporting them in the event we do have a hybrid model or at some point if we have to return back to remote learning, um, really being able to support our parents and our caregivers um, and then as well as the students. So um, we're working really hard as a district. Our district committee has representation from pre-K all the way through the tech center, so beyond 12th grade and the committee has really been collaborating and working well on creating really clear um, guidelines and suggestions to give to each of the individual schools um, to, to do with implementation in their own buildings. So I know last board meeting, there was a lot of suggestions thrown out there around video modeling. That's really where the bulk of our work is coming in. So really making those suggestions on video models social stories, um, not only for all students, but then also looking at how we may individualize things for um, students that might have a compromised immune system, uh, students who have a documented disability and maybe on a 504 plan, uh, students with IEPs, um, as well as students who might not be eligible for 504 plans or IEPs, but may have some behavioral challenges or some issues with impulse control that um, are gonna make it a challenge for them to access their learning in the classroom environment due to all of the new restrictions um, and health and safety guidelines. So we're, we're trying to troubleshoot all of those different areas um, at the district level to give that information to schools. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, I haven't been able to catch most of the Chat, so thank you for people, everybody for kind of helping respond. I did see Kim's at the end, and that, thank you for that information, Kim, because those are the type of things we need to be thinking about if the direction we go is hybrid, and we don't have all the answers about how that would be done, but that's, you bring up a very good point. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you, Kevin, I think I heard you say something about a survey. So are you surveying families for something? Uh, Yes, we are. We are serving. I will bring. I'll send this to people too. Maybe Bill, but we're sending something out to uh, all parents uh, just to get their thoughts and to learn a little bit about um, their ideas on remote. What about hybrid? Bill, maybe you could give a better, more specific on what some of the questions are. Yeah, I can get that. Uh, the pieces that we're trying to bring together are, um, we're trying to, we're gonna be surveying this, the families and the staff. Uh, we're putting that together. That's hopefully gonna go out on, on, um, on Thursday. And the biggest thing, the things we're looking for, what went, what do parents need? What do parents and students need for if we have to go remote? Um, and 
we were all, I'm going to need help from my colleagues. I don't have it up right this second. I was trying to talk and bring up the survey at the same time. Angela? Maybe Angela, go ahead. I got it you, right there, Bill. You're good. Can, Thanks. I <laughs> Thanks. So, I just didn't get it the other screen going. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I took the moment to print it before I came home. So uh, we want to get sort of their general, you know, hopes and concerns about next year. Also, with the, the new things we have to implement, we want to get an idea, uh, you know, are, are, is your child going to have trouble with any of these, like the daily health checks, the mask, the temperature? Um, and then if, you know, maybe they've done some work and they're going to say, hey, my, my family's set with, with these safety requirements. And then um, I think one of the things we wanted to ask, because it came out today that offering remote, I guess, is going to be an option. We didn't know, but we wanted to ask families. I know I've received emails. Um, particularly asking there's families that want to continue working with their schools, but they would prefer a remote option, even if we go to in person. So we're asking that question because it's going to help us with scheduling and everything else. And also we're going to have to figure that out because we have to figure out how we're going to provide the remote if we also have kids in person. So it's going to give us a little bit of data moving forward so we can see how many families definitely want the remote option. And um, also, pretty much asking some open-ended things about, you know, what other information do they need? Um, we're also asking some technology questions just to kind of loop back to that if they have access to internet and uh, technology devices. And then we're also asking the question about um, how their child would be getting to school. So if they are able to walk or uh, ride a bike or if they're going to bring them or pick them up, um, or if they're going to need the bus and, and then we'll have it for a.m. and p.m. And that'll help us too with the busing piece because it'll help us um, like Al pointed out, you know, obviously the health checks on the bus and then um, if we're trying to uh, do our best on the bus, if we have less numbers, it'll give us some idea um, around that. So that's the basic uh, parent survey. Um, I think I've got everything that we are, we're asking, but if anyone else wants to chime in, I think, I think that's it. Thank you. Sounds good. I, uh, before, you know, I'll answer any questions or will answer any questions. The one thing I would say, which I'm not sure I mentioned specifically with the Champlain Valley superintendents who are really working to, to do something, we did come up with two major priorities that is going to supersede everything else as we move along. One being whatever we decide, we decide together. We don't want Swanton looking at one way, Maple Run looking at something else, Franklin West looking at a different way, because we understand that there are families and teachers in a lot of these surrounding towns. Uh, and to tell you the truth, because we all have a little PTD, PSD, PTSD over this, we don't want this to turn into another thing like proficiencies. It's starting that way with a state that's giving you guidelines and not telling you how to do things and then look having individual districts try to make decisions. So the number one priority is what we do, we do together. And the second priority that goes right along with it is we prioritize the safety of our staff and our students. And from that, we come up with what we think best to do, given the guidance, if it finally comes out, if and when it finally comes out. Joanna? Thank you, Jeff. Um, so this, my, my, my comment goes specifically to Sean, but I, it's, it's a, the broader question of, you might want to cut out your video, Joanne. Maybe I missed it. Is there a committee to also work with the after school program and see how they can? Sorry. Sorry about that. Is that better? Yeah, I think so. Is that better? Yes. yes. No. You were asking oh. about the after school program. <laughs> um, because um, I was approached by, uh, okay. Well, w w let me ask the, the question. So I was approached um, by, the, uh, um, by the Fairfield Community Center. They're in the process of going for a grant and I've 
helped them write other grants before. And so they were just asking, they would love to be um, of support uh, to the school. And so they were looking at ways in which that they could support students outside the school day. And so I really encouraged them to reach out to you specifically to make sure that it was, you know, that would um, be, be a helpful bridge. Um, but I was just wondering to everybody, is there a committee that also includes the after school program and ways that the after school program can assist uh, whether it be through, you know, academics or mentoring for social emotional, um, but just ways that they could help in that out of school time. Thank you. So I'll address this. It came up in the continuity of learning group, um, and it was in the group that I was working in. Um, we haven't yet figured out whether we can offer before and after school care. And that's one of those conversations that we have to have um, as a district because that would eliminate a lot of the benefit of cohorting during the day. Um, also staffing those programs, which are only two hours a day um, is hard. So we still haven't had a chance to even talk about that yet. It is in there as, in, as something we have to hit, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, Grant, did you have a question? Yeah, um, I guess my question was um, public opinion and state guidance aside, um, what are the benefits of the in-person learning, um, you know, that are so beneficial or that are so important that we want to put the safety of the students and the teachers at risk and also take on the burden of uh, reopening the facilities, um, you know, both logistically and financially? John? So I'll jump in, but I know that my other colleagues are going to want to jump in with me. I'll say um, one of the first things that I know is a benefit is that we have our eyes on children who might be exposed to things that we could help with. I'm thinking in terms of child abuse or neglect. Um, we are an important set of eyes on them on a daily basis um, to see how they're doing, to get a check on their emotional status. Um, and we're, we're the ones who generally are the ones who notice things that are going on. So I think, I think overall kids, it's a safety issue for a lot of kids. So that's, that's the one I'll start with. I know everybody has a ton of them and we could all go on for days. So that's mine. Angela? So I would say when we look at, at children, um, we know there's some that did great with the remote learning and really flourished. We also know there's some with certain learning profiles and perhaps disabilities that the remote learning was very challenging for, and it would give us an opportunity to, to work with them. And, it, and it's not just students with disabilities. It could be the learning profile that they really um, benefit uh, greatly from an in-person approach. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we want to ask the question if families do want the remote option so they can be fully educated in that way. And, but it, it would give some uh, options to families. Um, but that, that's another uh, reason to, to have the kids in person. Um, there, there is some strong you know, benefit to, to the, the personal contact, even though I agree it's going to be challenging and you know, with masks and whatnot, we're going to have to weigh everything. And it's, it's definitely nothing we've ever had to do before. So, um, but I, I think it's a good question, Grant, and it's definitely going to be a challenge for us because keeping everyone safe um, is definitely our priority. Bill? Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. I, I'm going to just pull out the word equity again. Um, having school closed increased and not just by a little bit a lot and we saw it with our kids this spring the equity divide that we have within maple run um so we need to get our and not just educationally i'm talking i'm talking socially and emotionally as well 
we need to provide supports and there you just can't replace that in, human interaction with technology and i'm a former tech director so the technology cannot make up for the communication that happens face to face and i i would add every one of those is excellent and i would also add that's not an option from the state the option the, the requirement is we need to get kids into school and for all the reasons that were mentioned, but they made that quite clear. John? And if we do ever get thrown back into a remote only, one of the things the teachers have been talking so much about is it just happened so fast and they didn't have time to prepare the kids for it. So the very first thing we're doing when we bring the kids back is we're teaching them how to access us when they're not with us. Like it's, it's become this whole new curriculum component. The very first thing we're going to teach them is how to be independent learners because we're so used to them relying on us and that feels really good until you can't have that. So how do we now shift the way that teachers think? And, and the teachers are the ones who are asking for this. They're saying, we've got to teach the kids how to do it when I'm not there and how to reach me. They have to know how to, in the classroom, they know how to get my attention. They need to know how to do that remotely. So those are the things we're going to really focus on because we know at any point in time, we could be sent back to remote. Yeah. Are you all set, Kevin? I am. Grant had a follow-up. Who did? Grant had a follow-up. Grant. Thanks, everybody. Um, so I do have a follow-up. Uh, it sounds like uh, the feedback is um, for some students, the in-person is greatly beneficial. And I understand why that is now, thank you. Um, but for other students, the online would be perfectly fine too. Um, I'm thinking at this point that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a survey or reaching out to parents and finding out what they want. A more uh, engaged discussion with parents, between parents, teachers, and even potentially the, the kids um, as part of it might be more effective in determining which approach is right on an individual basis. Um, and so I, I might suggest that we do that uh, or set up a system for that kind of like a pre, uh, you know, like the, like the midterm conferences, the year in conferences we do, but in advance um, in order to get the kids into whatever situation is, is right for them. Well, I'm going to throw my sense in. Go ahead, Al. Uh, one of the things that bothers me about remote learning is for many students, they know how to operate their two thumbs. And technology has taken away a lot. As great as it is, it also has been a detriment in many ways, particularly social and interaction and emotionally. So I, th I think the important thing is if we can get the kids back to school, it's gonna be a far better opportunity for them to be able to uh, seek the comradeship that they had and, more, and develop more. So I'm looking forward to the opening and understanding those who don't want to send their child at the moment to, and I don't blame them, uh, but I think the remote learning is not ideal. Uh, anything except if we are absolutely have to. Thanks, Al. Sue, did you have something? Yeah, I was just going to say um, that I, I understand that it's going to be important to get kids back to school. Um, from the social, the whole social and emotional learning aspect, and it goes way beyond that. I do think that um, online learning is a struggle for a lot of kids. I have a, um, a student that's headed back to her third year at UVM who last first semester last year was on the dean's list in a really rigorous program. And at this point, because online learning was so challenging for her, is trying to figure out if she's going to take a year off if she's going to even live on campus so lots of things i think ultimately it comes down to what's the greater good and i think that as a parent for me 
Um, certainly having, I'm going to say having the worst case scenario presented to me as soon as possible so I can plan for that is um, going to be important for so many, so many parents that need to plan like next week how they're going to manage child care next month. So I just wanted to put that out there. Yep. Agreed. Joanna? Um, I'm going to turn my video off. I just want to echo uh, something that Grant just said, because um, it's something that I've talked to my principal at, um, at, at the school that I work at, and I think it's an absolute fabulous idea. I know that it happens at Highgate. Um, that's my dog, sorry. <laughs> and that is having um, individual parents, uh, teacher meetings at the beginning or prior to school starting. I think it's a fabulous idea. I think one thing that we learned um, in COVID is um, that the benefit of ha having um, better improved communication with, with families has been monumental. And um, I, I just have had such amazing experiences um, with improved communication with families. And I think that if we could start off the school year uh, with that, that you would see uh, huge gains in almost every classroom. Thank you. All right, I think we're going to move on to the next item, if that's okay, Kevin. Yes. Um, item 7B, we have a update on a legal matter. I would look for a motion uh, with a finding that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage under 1 VSA 3A1S, which is confidential attorney client communications. Thank you, Al. I'll second. Thank you, Nina. All those in favor, signify it by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Eyes have it, nine zero. We'll move that to executive session. Item 8A, new, under new business. I'm guessing this is Leanne, adult ed lease renewal, or maybe Lisa? Lisa, okay. Yes, first of all, I just want to call your attention to the beautiful wall behind me. This is my son's bedroom because everybody's downstairs very loud but he received an art credit during remote learning for this wall that he did so just wanted to share that with you <laughs> uh, so as a part of adult education training we have an off-site location where the dmv is it's at the valley crossroads plaza and that's where we hold most of our medical training and we've had this lease in place even before I came on board and I'm in my fifth year in this position. NMC purchased the building last year and they are honoring the uh, year by year lease and nothing has changed. I said we don't want an increase because um, of COVID so they kept the price the same and it's a pretty straightforward lease. So we're seeking approval tonight to continue that on. I move that we approve the adult ed lease uh, Reno with NMC. Thank you, Al. Can I get a second? Joanna, thank you. Any questions about this? Again, it's just a continuation of something that we've been doing. All right, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Nine zero, you're all set, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Okay, then I'm guessing this is Bill or Brett, I don't know if Brett's on, um, Agency of Transportation MOU for antenna location at BSA. Yes, thank you, Jeff, that is me. Uh, we have had for the past 10 years, uh, we've been hosting the Agency of Transportation's antenna that keeps track of communications, not their CB, but there's actually some GPS communications that go with their trucks uh, around the St. Albans area. Uh, it's been on the top of the 
in the uh, old hospital uh, way up high and uh, uh, they've used it for a long time. They had a new personnel who started this year and found out for all their co-locations in the state of Vermont, they didn't have an MOU between the location and the agency of transportation. So this was a cleanup on their part that I actually uh, started last September with them and we were finally able to get to a place. It, it was mainly just getting the MOU done. We've been very happy hosting with them. We we give them, they have ability to plug in their little device. Uh, so we supply power and an internet connection and they're able to get their information on their trucks, from their trucks uh, back to the Department of uh, the Agency of Transportation. So, so this is something we've been doing. We're just trying to fix it. Uh, I move that we approve the Agency of Transportation MOU for uh, antenna. Location at BFA. Thank you, Al. Second, please. Joanna, thank you. Any questions for Bill about this? Again, something that's been doing. Just a good service. Grant? Okay. Nope. No questions. <laughs> the box came. <laughs> Not this <around>. time. <laughs> Not this time. <laughs> okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. Who's getting ice cream? <laughs> I don't want to know. They're, they're next to my house. <laughs> okay, item 8C. This is Bill again, I believe. Easement for Green Mountain Power at BFA. Yep. Unfortunately, Jeff, you're going to get a lot of me tonight. I've got a lot of these items. Um, in the reconstruct the renovations at BFA, uh, we are moving some power on the over the south parking lot, and we'll be where we didn't before have, we had power going to the ground, we actually will have it going in the air to a pole that's between the parking lot that goes up behind the tech center and the one that goes to automotive and then it goes down into the ground and goes into the, uh, through a trench into the building. The poles have actually been set. Uh, so this is a little bit, a little bit reversed, but we need the board to approve an easement. Green Mountain Power just came to us uh, about a week, two weeks ago and said, we actually need an easement and the board ha is the only one that can approve these real estate transactions. So we're asking for authorization from the board for Green Mountain Power to have overhead lines over the South parking lot. Can I get a motion? I move that the easements for Green Mountain Power uh, at BFA be approved. Thank you, Al. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Nina. Anybody have any questions about this for Bill? So Could we or should we ask if they bury them? Uh, it's not part of the project grant. So we haven't buried from that green strip that's in between the two and then it's buried from there into the building. It's just not part, of, it's not gonna be done from that part of the green strip over the um, electronic sign area. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it 9 0. Item 8D. I'm not sure if this is Stephanie and Sean tag teaming or, but the bid award for iPads for, F, for Fairfield and ECP. So I can take that one. We, um, are in need of iPads, uh, touch devices for our students in pre-K through grade one. They're developmentally appropriate. The, um, it's a lease deal for three years. So after three years of paying the lease fees, we buy them for a dollar per uh, device. We currently don't have, I think we have five iPads in the whole building that actually can run the newest software. Um, we had competitive quotes from other types of devices, Android devices, which are um, much easier to mess with. And uh, so we would prefer to go with iPads. They are uh, educationally sound. And uh, we're hoping that you will approve that. And can you tell me, Sean, who, who that was with and what the dollar amount was? So it was Apple Education, and I am not looking at the agenda because I'm looking at all of your beautiful faces, but I believe it was 30-something thousand dollars. 34, $34,015. 34, 
Thank you. $34,015 paid over the course of three yes. years. Three years. Um, right. So it would be 12000 ish per year. And that includes 17 devices for the early childhood classroom in our building. And it also includes um, cases to protect them and Apple Care and uh, a way to manage all of the apps on the devices. Yeah. Which is what we normally get. Yeah. So could I get a motion to award the bid for iPads for Fairfield Center School to oh. Apple Education in the amount of $34,000 and 15, $34,050. Thank you, Al. Second? Joanna, thank you. Any other questions for Sean about this? I have one. Grant. Are the numbers up, down, not affected at all by COVID? And if they're up by COVID, can we apply for some kind of reimbursement? That's a good question. We aren't going to actually send the devices home with the kids at that age. We're going to keep them in the building. So this number is just the number of kids that we have in the classrooms right now. Um, he, he meant the price of the units themselves. Is it maybe? No, I meant, I meant the number of units. Are buying them. Oh. But, the um, but for the price also, maybe, if that's affected. Yeah, no, the price I don't think was affected, but the number of units wasn't either. We just got one sort of per kid so that when they're working on them in the classroom, each kid could have their own. And that, they, that way they wouldn't have to share devices, which is a recommendation. Would they be sharing if it wasn't for COVID? Yes. Yes, they probably would be. Well, not necessarily. But, but, but. we're looking to move to one-to-one. -to -one. Throughout. Yeah, I mean, really what we're trying to do is we're trying to create a system where our kids can get onto some of the um, learning games and um, products like iReady and Lexi to Learning, which are intervention programs. And right now, having so few available, we're not able to do it at all. Next year, all the kids would be able to move to the de onto the devices mm -hmm. as they get done with maybe an in-person activity. They can move on to a device-for-device-based activity. They can work on that for a little while. Um, so ideally, I would, I would have one-to-one. -one, I mean, I have one-to-one -one Chromebooks for everybody else in the building, so I would like to have one-to-one -one iPads uh, for the children at the younger ages as well. I have a quick question. Why, why iPads versus Chromebooks? Because I know we've been doing bids for Chromebooks. Just curious. Yeah, um, it's the younger ages, pre-K, K and first. Um, they lack a lot of the manual dexterity that it requires to actually hit the right keys in the right sequences. Whereas on an iPad, it seems to be more forgiving and they can use images and they can do a lot of touch and drag which works better for their tiny hands because they really, I mean, they're still learning how to use scissors. They can't really be expected to figure out, you know, where the A key is. And so, yeah, developmentally, we start in our school with the Chromebooks at second grade so that by third grade, when they take the S back on a Chromebook, they're sort of ready for that device. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? All those in favor? of awarding the bid for Fairfield iPads to Apple Education, the amount of $34,000 and 34,015, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you all for the thumbs up, that's helpful. Okay, item A, E, uh, BFA Chromebooks. Jeff, this is me, this is Bill again, I'll be taking that one. Um, at the, um, as we all know, uh, BFA has been working its way to a one-to-one -one device deployment and this will get BFA to it, which is maybe a, a little accelerated, but we were able to find some ways of reconfiguring the budget to make it happen. Um, and so this is gonna allow BFA to ha have a fleet of 850 Chromebooks, one for every student. Uh, along with cases and management, uh, which will be excellent. That will be in alignment with our K-8 colleagues. Really, as Sean said, it's either 2-8 or 3-8, depending which building for Chromebook deployment. Um, and we'll actually all be on the same uh, type of machine. So uh, we're recommending that you award the bid to Watley Computer Associates for 108,908 
and 82 cents. So moved. Thank you, Al. Second? I'll second. Thank you, Nina. Any questions for Bill? It is good that you guys will finally be at one to one. Steve. Yeah, I'm just curious after, for an incoming freshman getting one after four years, I know some school districts offer an opportunity for the kid to take it with them. Is that something that's ever considered? Um, we do that with older devices than four years. So if we have kids that we know need them, uh, it's, it's more on a need basis than an option to every kid, Steve. We can get about five, and if we push it, we can almost get six years out of a Chromebook. Um, we're having to push to get to 850, to be honest with you. We're pushing a couple old devices. Okay, thank you. Joanna. I have a silly question, I think. <laughs> um, you better do your video again. Are, do you say you're buying 850 or you're buying... <laughs> I think I got it, Jeff. I, I think I we're buying... Heard. Yeah, you so we're, we're bu that you're buying enough. Jeff, do you want me to take a shot at it? Or? Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Bill. So uh, we currently have about 500 plus, And the reason I say plus is because some of them are getting pretty old. But we have 500 reliable machines. We see an enrollment of 850. We're buying 350 uh, Chromebooks and 850 cases in this bid. Yeah, that makes sense, Sue? So, Does that mean students will take them home with them? We're working on that, Sue. I'm sorry I don't have a direct answer yet. In the COVID, we were giving them out. Uh, we're, we're, Martin has just come aboard and he's helping us with that, that piece. And I'm sorry I have to be vague on that because we're still working on the answer to it. Okay, that looks like that's it for questions. Um, so the motion on the table is to award the uh, BFA Chromebooks bid to Wally Computer Associates for 108908 and 82 cents. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, nine zero. Item 8F, this is Angela, I think, um, bid award for PPE. Yes, thank you. It is, um, and I, I think you can see the uh, the spreadsheet there. But um, I put this together. We put it out to bid, and when we just had um, one company come through, Martha worked with us. I, I was really trying to move quickly on it because time is of the essence, and some of these things are going to take several weeks to arrive. And so um, we do need board approval because of the dollar amount. Um, I did send a, uh, an additional PO that's to the same company for um, $3,150 today to Martha and that will purchase uh, the smaller disposable masks for the young children so that we have some of those on hand. So the total cost is $115,000 three hundred and eighty six dollars for for what we um, have in the order can you say that's that again Angela what's up can you say the dollar amount again please uh, one hundred and fifteen thousand three hundred and eighty six thank you Martha can tell me if that's off but... oh she will I know <laughs> and so what as I said before what I did is I took you know, about 2,700 students, 550 staff across the district. And we, this is a best guess. And this is just to get us started because it's really, it's hard to know under these circumstances, you know, how much hand sanitizer will we go through? How many masks? We don't know if families will send them in with their own or, how, but we need to be prepared. So this is our first, um, our first go around. We do have a state contract a bid um, around that and so if, if they're cheaper for some other items we'll use them as well uh, but this is uh, to get us started and we're we're hoping should have these before school starts and we'll we'll come to you Susan Angela will there be the bid be 
42 Halo branding solutions for the amount of whatever. 115,386 dollars. Thank you, Al. Can I get a second? Thank you, Steve. Um, Sue, you had a question. So is the expectation going to be that we're giving out disposable masks every single day um, to all students? And I don't know if maybe somebody else can answer for Angela. Just I can. I can. Oh, there you are, Angela. Sorry, you're. Angela's back. Okay. Nope, she's not back. But that was Joan who was <laughs> going to chime in. Oh, all, right. Go ahead, Joan. all right, well, I'm back. Oh, you are back. Look I at that. Am. So, Angela, um, the, the question was, um, are you anticipating that you're going to give out a mask to every student every day? We really don't know. We need to be prepared to do so because they are required. Um, I, I'm assuming that some families will want their own cloth masks, um, but we do need to be prepared for that. So, and so but, my question is, is how many weeks of supplies do you, are you guessing that this is? Like say worst case. Um, it'll probably get us through the first uh, few weeks of school. Okay. And some, the, uh, not all of it was disposable, right? Because there was like thermometers and uh, dispensing machines yeah. and stuff like that. There's uh, th thermometers for all the schools and and in addition to what we might have purchased uh, this spring, and then um, the hand sanitizing station, which those will be permanent. Um, and then the rest of it um, is, you know, gowns, face shields, N95 masks, uh, and many different size uh, gloves. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? So the motion on the floor is to award the bids for PPE to Halo Branding Solutions in the amount of $115,386. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it, nine zero. Thank you, everybody. Okay, item 8G, um, we made a mistake and it wasn't attached to your packet. So I'd like to just talk about it tonight and then we can vote on it at our August meeting. Okay because nobody got to see the information. And who's going to do this? Is this Martha? No, oh, this is me, Jeff, again. OK, Bill. Oh, I'm sorry. I told you, I told you, you get you get lots of Bill tonight. Um, there, when you get when you get the copy, I'm sorry this didn't meet the packet. Um, most of the change, the, the guidelines are almost exactly the same as they were last year that the board approved. Most of the changes have to do with the change to statewide health care. And as you know, Jeff and Jack, and for anyone else who was on the negotiating committees, that that's thing, those are things we just had to change in the master agreements. We need to change it in the non-union employee guidelines. So uh, that that's really what it is in here. Yeah. Um, so. I would just ask everybody to look at that before the next meeting. Um, I agree. There did not appear to be any substantial changes in there. So yeah. Okay, item 8H. That is me as well, Jeff, or maybe the two of us, but I will start off. Um, when we were negotiating with the teachers, we had agreed in negotiations that there were six side letters, which you have in your packet, that would be continued from this previous year to this next year, but the board never authorized the continuation of those side letters. So there are six side letters in there um there's one for a side letter for an agreement for early retirement benefit there's one for um a visa for one of our teachers who's canadian resident <coughs> that they need to have um agreement for a duty-free lunch agreement for additional compensation for national industry certification that's for our tech center colleagues ex educators it's very similar to what we do for national board certification um agreement for personal time incentive so folks that don't use their personal days and we've actually found that to be very successful um and an agreement for if a teacher is placed with an apprenticeship license 
and doesn't have their bachelor's degree, which where you still probably have another year of need of this agreement. Um, I have talked with the association, Jeff, and I'm sorry I didn't get, wasn't able to get back to you before this meeting on that, uh, but they're in agreement that we have the right six from what we talked about in negotiations. Okay. Yeah, so these are, are um, all side letters that existed last year with our prior contract, and the negotiating team left it with um, the union that we, would, that we would try to extend them out another year. Obviously, the board has to approve it, so we couldn't guarantee anything. But if the board is willing, I would um, like to just approve them all at, all together. Uh, with I one. Will have we approved the side letters uh, totaling six uh, for the master agreement. As presented. Thank you, Al. Can I get a second? A second. I'll second that. Thank you, Jack. Any questions? Nothing's changed in any of these except the date and you know the side letters just run for one year and then then they disappear unless we um, authorize them. Okay, seeing none. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? I just have it. Nine zero. Okay, item 8i is a new required a mandatory policy, um, BO8 electronic communication. Bill, is this you? Uh, Kevin, are you taking that or am I? I couldn't remember. I'll take it and you can tag team with me if, you need to, if we need to. Okay. So this is a required policy that VSBA has come up with. Uh, it could be argued that it's about a year late, but, but it's it's in there now run electronic communications. It's pretty straightforward. Most people we see feel it is necessary. Uh, there is one thing in there that we're not overly happy with, but we can live with and, and we don't have a choice. And that is around teacher communication with students. It talks about there could be no communication between 10, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. And you might think that that's, well, of course, but especially in COVID, we've got teachers working at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night, doing papers and things like that and, um, and, and sending something off. But we're going to have to look at other ways of doing it. I know there are capabilities where you can send it off at 11 o'clock. It doesn't arrive until a certain time in the morning. And we're going to have to look, do those sort, sort of things. We actually asked the SBA about that one aspect just to get their idea of justification behind it. And they said they struggled with that pretty, uh, quite a bit. It was probably the biggest thing they struggled with. But they ultimately felt one thing that statistics show is that's a way that adults sometimes groom kids uh, to communicate late at night. And they don't want any pretext of thought that that might be happening. So that's why that part's in there. And we can live with it and we work around it. But what we're asking this time today is just for you to uh, look at it for your first reading uh, to come back and, and discuss it next time. Yeah. Um, yeah. There could be automated communications from a learning management system maybe that, you know, occurred during those hours, something like that. And yep. it, it seemed like it covered email and social media, but it didn't cover electronic meeting software. Is that right? I didn't notice that. Seemed like it, that it didn't. Um, so right now, I think I would like a motion to um, to warn this policy and place it on the August agenda for consideration for adoption. So moved. Thank you, Al. Second. Second. Thanks, Jack. Any questions? So you have time to study it. We can talk about it at the next meeting. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, knowing zero. Whew. 
All right, we made it. I move that we approve the warrants. The <laughs> warrant of knowledge that passes of this motion or act as individual board members notific authorization of their signature on these warrants. Thank you, Al. Second. I'll second. Thank you, Nina. Anybody have questions about the warrant? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it, nine zero. Uh, nine B, superintendent's report. Do you really want to hear from me anymore? No. Uh, moving on, board announcements. Anybody have anything they wanted to share? I don't see anything. Agenda items for future meetings. Our next meeting is on August 5th. Steve has something he wants to say. You missed Who it. Does? I just want to say a quick thank you to everyone um, for all the hard work that you put into uh, getting our kids back to school in some fashion or the other. Just, just thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. And it's not over. It's um, done. Agenda items for future meetings. I think, like I said, I think our meeting is August 5th, but I could be wrong. I was hoping oh, Brenda, yeah, it's August 5th. No, it's not. It's not? It's the 19th. 19th. Oh. oh, it's still on the calendar though. Thank you, August 19th. Brenda, can you check that? The 19th is in there, but the 5th is in there. <laughs> Okay, and now I would look for a motion to go into executive session under 1 BSA 313A1F to uh, discuss confidential attorney client communications. So moved. Thank you, Al. Second. Thanks, Nina. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it. We are in executive session. And I didn't say who to include. So the executive session is to include just me, just Kevin. Bye, Martha. Bye, everybody. Thank Happy you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good evening. Uh, Brenda. Do you want this room and just not let anybody else in after we leave? Or how do you want to do it? Yeah, we can just stay here. We can kick 